All right, let's get into this DrovoRub malware virus for Linux machines, both servers and workstations. Uh, I'm going to just jump right on the desktop because I have a lot to go over here. Um, I want to actually get into, one, the document and a lot of the publications that have actually come out about this, and then two, actually show you how to check to see if, hey, you have it, uh, two, how to mitigate against it, and then three, just some security best practices. I put together a GitHub project that you can run just a sample script, and it'll help harden uh, your Linux systems. Uh, not necessarily make it undetectable, but it just help reduce some of that the, the, those attack vectors. Uh, so with all that, a uh, lot to go over, let's get into it. All right, so here is the document that was released just a couple days ago by the NSA and FBI as a joint conglomeration of blah, blah, blah. It's 45 pages long. I read all 45 pages of it, and there's a lot of fluff here. Um, I almost like talking in circles a lot of times. I really hated this document, to be honest with you. It felt more like a, a lot of exposition in the middle. There was not much uh, detailing how you get infected. Uh, I, maybe they just don't know. And then two, the preventative measures I thought was just like a little blurb, a little two paragraphs at the end of this 45 page document. And then there was just a ton of of how the virus communicates in the back and forth. And uh, I was just like not very interested in that portion of this as I didn't find much value in it to as a user of a, a Linux machine, whether that's a system admin or just a traditional desktop user. So let's jump on to what the actual virus is, how it does its installation. So pretty much every single article has this one piece of graphic that's in this 45 page document. Basically, it's just kind of showing how it works. Uh, as far as the installation, you'd have to install a kernel module uh, when you go to install this, this virus, which if you've never installed a kernel module in Linux, that's not a trivial task. It's not like you can just accidentally click something and then just have it run and install the kernel module. Uh, a lot of times there's dependencies, like most people need headers and, and uh, maybe even a DKMS module loaded to, to get something like this going. So I don't, know how this works as I don't have a live virus to test in a lab. Uh, I would love to see it in, in actual reality, but I haven't seen any videos on it. I wasn't able to actually get my hands on it anywhere. But uh, anyways, that's how it, how it functions. It needs to actually install as a kernel module, and then that'll hide the client binary that then transmits files to uh, the evil people on the other end. So that, that's basically the gist of this virus. And uh, with that said, let's scroll down towards the end here and get into some of the preventative measures and actually detection techniques that happen and how you can actually maybe test your system to see if you have it. And if you did, I would love to know in the comments section. So as far as the preventative mitigations at the bottom of the document, it goes over implying Linux updates. Make sure you're on Linux kernel 3.7 or later. Um, yeah. 3.7 or later. 3.7 came out in December of 2012. Um, I think everyone's on 3.7 or later. Uh, thanks for the heads up. Next, they're going to tell us that uh, there's there's a bug they found in Windows 7 and we need to be worried. Uh, I, it's hard for me to take this seriously when you put crap like that into a document. Um, yeah. Anyhow, let's let's move past that. I'm trying to be as objective as possible. Moving to the next thing. Uh, preventing untrusted kernel modules, which this is good for a variety of different attacks, not just this specific virus. So uh, basically, it's just saying, hey, don't be installing unsigned kernels and those types of things. I agree with this sentiment. When it comes to secure boot, I kind of hate secure boot. I rarely ever use it as it can make troubleshooting a pain or uh, whenever you try to use like a USB drive to load up util utilities, it can be very difficult. However, that said, you can still uh, not use unsigned kernel modules, and you can also check your system for those uh, unsigned kernel modules. And I, I mean, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and flip over to terminal real fast and kind of show you how to do that. So uh, let's just, I made a little cheat sheet here. Let's just check for those unsigned kernels real fast. And this line, which I'll drop a link, I'll, I'll put a, make a little web page specifically over this virus uh, so you can actually. I uh, kind of check to see, hey, do you have any unsigned kernels or anything like that? Worth checking out good 
false positives in here. Like it just because a kernel pops up in here doesn't mean that it's a virus, by the way. It just means it's unsigned. You'll see this with like VirtualBox or NVIDIA drivers as those are kernel modules that sometimes aren't signed. So uh, be, you know, don't don't freak out if you see like VBox and then something as the, the actual kernel module in here or an NVIDIA uh, driver. Obviously, if you have an NVIDIA card, you're probably gonna need the NVIDIA kernel module. So those are some uh, examples of unsigned kernels that are safe and okay. Uh, as far as enabling secure boot, getting to the second portion of it, um, why I recommend secure boot as a way of signing and doing all this is you kill two birds with one stone. You kind of harden your actual startup. So if you have it on a laptop, you can easily uh, enable this and get to it. Uh, if you are doing it, I don't recommend Arch. I did have some issues enabling secure boot on Arch. However, on my Debian Linux Mint box inside, uh, I didn't have any problems. Uh, that Linux Mint box, I basically just came in here, said, okay, type this in. Okay, secure boot is disabled. And then I could type this in and just do a sudo before this and enable the validation. And then this would prompt that machine. Uh, you type in your password on reboot, as long as secure boot is enabled in your BIOS and everything's set up, you might need to regenerate your keys. Um, but once that's done, you should just type in, you'll get a couple prompts like, hey, enter the third letter of your password, enter the first letter, and you go through this about two or three times just to verify you know your password really well. And then it'll boot in, you have secure boot enabled. Uh, but that's the, the quick rundown of secure boot. I didn't want to get into this because uh, enabling it on Arch and, and some of the other distros can be a very, very long video. So that's just the, the really quick crash course in secure boot on uh, Linux. Now, as far as other projects I've done, uh, we can do a git clone. And I, I put this in made secure-linux here. I made a little a quick executable. This is going to help secure your Linux uh, box right out of the gate. Uh, again, I'll put this all on my website and I'll put a link in the description so you can easily check this. But if you look at this project, there's a secure.sh I did. And I'm just going to walk through the actual script itself before running it just so you can see what the script is doing. So what this is, is just a basic bash script and I'm doing three big things here. Uh, one, I'm enabling UFW. So the two packages I install on every Linux installation is UFW. So if you're on a Debian, apt install UFW or uh, Fedora, you'll do yum uh, or DNF install UFW and fail to ban. Um, those are the really only two packages I use to really secure and it really hardens and takes a lot of attack vectors out of Linux boxes if uh, you're worried about this and you want to harden your security bit. So one, this limits SSH. SSH is probably the most attacked port on any computer. Uh, so making sure port 22 is secure is good. What this does is the limit. It limits how many things can be, how many requests can be done. I think uh, five is the default. So if you, uh, you can only hit it about five times every two seconds or 10 seconds, it puts basically what's called a tar pit. And that just slows down those attacks so people can't brute force their way into your server. And then it just allows all HTTP and HTTPS traffic, denies all other incoming, and then allows pretty much everything going out of the box itself. So if you did have other services running and you're doing like a Plex service or something like that on your Linux box, you'd want to go UFD allow, I think it's the uh, 32400 is uh, Plex's default port and put TCP. So that's it. Or maybe you need to run open VPN server on your actual Linux box. You do UFW allow, and that one's usually 1194 UDP for that port. So. That's just a couple examples of how you would allow or punch holes in this firewall. But this is just a basic firewall setup where it would block most of everything coming into the system or trying to attack your system, which is just a good, a good thing to do pretty much on every system. As far as hardening uh, system control, this basically does some things like uh, filters out a lot of IPv4 traffic, uh, takes out some man in the middle of tax and some other things like that. So. It's worth actually just running this. It does clean up some of this. It also uh, disables kernel modules. If you did have a virtual box or NVIDIA, you might need to take this line out of the script. You might need to just delete this line. 
uh, just open it up in a text editor, delete it before running the script. Um, this right here under etchost.conf, it just basically changes this around, helps prevent spoofing and just harden security a little bit more. Most modern distros these days probably don't need this. It's probably a little bit overkill or a little outdated, but you can run it on pretty much any distro and it's fine. And then the finally enabling fail to ban. Much like slowing down the attacks on port 22 with the limit command in UFW, uh, eventually you want someone that's constantly hitting SSH, let's say trying to request access to your PC or log into your PC. If they do that 10 or 20 times, you wanna ban that person. And that's exactly what fail to ban does. It just says, hey, you, I see you, and now you're banned. Any more traffic from your IP or request from it will be denied. And it just completely bans that person. So great to have on every, every Linux system I install fail to ban. There's just no reason not to have it. And then finally at the end, I like to do a net stat. Uh, some people don't have netstat in installed. I think it's primary tap, uh, package. If it's not netstat, sometimes it's net-tools. Uh, but you run that and it should give you kind of what's happening on your system. What is requesting internet access or sending it out? So let's run this script really fast. We can just simply do a sudo as we do need to be super user running it. And we'll do secure.sh, type our sudo password in. It'll add the rules and then do everything in there just with a blink of an eye. So now we can see all the programs on this side and kind of walk through what each one is. Cloud Drive, I know that right now is my Cloud Drive that's on this actual system. Um, this is a Synology drive right over here. You can see this. If you're curious and you're like, oh, is it? Uh, you can easily just do an exit and then just simply do a netstat that's ton LP. And this will just kind of let you know what else is happening here. So I can see right now UDP 5353 is being used by Brave. Uh, that's probably DNS, I think, uh, off the top of my head. That's probably what that is. Uh, other things here, you can see we have some uh, SSH activity right here. Uh, all local, which is not bad. I don't, I don't care too much about that. But past that, I think we pretty much have this box somewhat secured. It, it's not 100%. If this was an actual server, I'd probably install like SE Linux or AppArmor at the very least. I really like SE Linux for a lot of more industrial or enterprise uh, grade server setups uh, as SE Linux really has a lot of granular controls and you can do a lot of things with it. So as far as security goes, it's always a journey, not a destination. Always be thinking about what you can do to make yourself more secure. Uh, maybe secure boot is right for you. Obviously for this PC, for me, it wasn't. So I left it disabled. Um, but if it is for you and you have like a traveling laptop that you want to try to secure down, by all means, use Secure Boot. It's, it's not necessarily bad, but it's just one tool in an arsenal of things that I would do, uh, whether that be encrypting your drive, whether it be a, a whole host of different things that you can do, obviously hardening your security like we did in this video, uh, and then just keep going above and beyond. This is just a very base line of what should be done on pretty much every system as there's a lot more things that you can do to make yourself more secure. So be thinking about that. And if you like this video, let me know down below, or if you got infected and oh my God, that test file disappeared again, let me know down below in the comment section. And with all that said, a big shout out to all the Chris Titus members without you. I couldn't make videos like this one and I'll see you in the next one.